right, everyone get ready because we are going deep on a breaking news story that has a lot of people concerned. The first human cases of bird flu right here in Washington state. And we're not just gonna read headlines. We're gonna hear it straight from those local news reports as the story was unfolding. Yeah, it's gonna be like we have a front row seat to the whole thing, but we're not just gonna passively listen. We were going to break it down piece by piece. By the end of this deep dive, you'll know exactly what went down, uh, why it's so important and what it all means for you. Exactly. We are cutting through all the noise and getting you the information you need. So let's go back to the beginning, to that very first oh no moment. It all started on an egg farm um, in Franklin County. Franklin County. That's important. That sets the scene geographically. It all started north of Kennewick, about a two hour drive southwest of Spokane. Right. And this farm near Pasco, they found cases of avian flu in their flock. And initially 25 workers were potentially exposed. So yeah, a lot. Very nerve wracking. It definitely raised some eyebrows, and then things escalated pretty quickly. Because the CDC confirmed two cases in those poultry workers, and that's what put bird flu officially on the map in Washington state, the first ever human transmission. Okay, I have to admit, hearing human transmission always, um, it always makes me nervous. But there's some good news here, right? There is. There's some very good news, and this is a big one. No human-to-human -human transmission so far, meaning it's not spreading like a typical flu virus. That's a relief. Big sigh of relief, yeah. Okay, that makes me feel a little bit better, but I'm guessing they weren't taking any chances. What steps did they take to contain this thing? They did a lot. 800,000 birds were euthanized in Washington state alone. And then on top of that, another 150,000 birds in Clackamas County, Oregon. Wow. We're talking serious preventative measures. 800,000 birds, that's a crazy number. Shows how seriously they're taking this outbreak. But with all these headlines about numbers and containment, it's easy to forget about the people. What about those workers who tested positive? How are they doing? That's where this idea of one health comes in. It's not just about protecting human health. It's not just about protecting animal health. It's about how connected those two things are. Okay, I'm starting to see. So one health means considering those workers as part of the bigger picture. Exactly. It's all intertwined. It's a holistic approach to problem solving. Yeah, I like that. It's a reminder that we can't just focus on one part of a situation without considering the other parts. But back to those workers, are they okay? Yeah, thankfully they are. Those workers haven't experienced any serious illness. They haven't needed to go to the hospital. They are recovering at home. Oh, that's good. Which is a good sign. That's a huge relief. But I imagine there's still worries, especially when it comes to their jobs, their income. You're right. There are growing concerns about how this will impact them financially. Some might face lost wages because of that mandatory self-isolation after testing positive. And the United Farm Workers have been very vocal about the need for employer education and support systems for workers in these types of situations. It makes sense. Their jobs are already demanding and now they're dealing with this outbreak on top of it. It's a lot to handle. So if we zoom out a little bit, what's the overall risk assessment here? Should people in Washington be worried? It's important to take a breath here and look at the facts. Health officials have said very clearly that the risk of widespread human transmission is minimal. Minimal, but not zero. So where is this virus even coming from? Did it suddenly mutate in these farm birds? Or is it something else? Actually, the main source is migrating wild waterfowl. So ducks, geese, swans, you know. These birds naturally carry the virus. So they're unknowingly carrying it across borders, spreading it wherever they go. Exactly. And it's estimated that 15% of those migrating birds could be carrying the virus. 15%? Wow. Okay, now I'm starting to see why this is so complex. It's not just about containing it on one farm. It's about how it moves through these wild birds. So what can they even do to handle this? Well, remember that one health approach. This is where it's really important. It brings together human health agencies, animal health agencies, environmental agencies. They all work together to get a handle on this. I'm seeing how important that is. You know, they're recognizing that the health of those birds is connected to the health of the workers, which is connected to the overall health of the environment. It's all one big system. Yeah, exactly. And that teamwork is really important for effective prevention, surveillance, and response to outbreaks like this. Okay, that makes sense. But let's get practical. What can people do to protect their own birds at home? Well, there are a few steps you can take to minimize the risk. First, keep your pet birds away from wild waterfowl. You might even consider keeping them indoors, especially during peak migration. Second, avoid anything that might attract waterfowl to your yard, like bird feeders. And finally, if you see any sick or dead wildlife, report it to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. 
Those are helpful tips. It's good to know there are things people can do to keep their birds safe. So let's talk about how this virus actually spreads. It's not like catching a cold, right? No, it's not. You're right. The main way this virus spreads is through contact with infected bird feces. So not like airborne, like the regular flu. Right, not in that way. It's mainly direct contact. And while anyone could technically get it, there are certain groups who are at a higher risk. Like who? Besides the poultry workers? Well, anyone who works with poultry or fish or wildlife are at higher risk, obviously. But you also have to think about the people who spend a lot of time outside, like hunters, campers, even hikers. They're all potentially at risk because they could come into contact with those infected birds. Yeah, that makes sense. But I'm guessing that a walk in the woods isn't going to land you in the hospital? No, no. It usually takes prolonged contact with a lot of infected animals for transmission to happen. We're talking repeated and significant exposure, not just a quick encounter. Okay, that's reassuring. But let's say someone does get infected. What are the symptoms? What should they look out for? Well, the most common symptoms in humans are actually pretty mild, which can be tricky. You're looking at respiratory issues, cold-like symptoms, maybe congestion, sore throat, even pink eye. So, not very obvious symptoms. Seems like you could easily mistake it for a regular cold. Exactly. And that's why it's so important to know the risk factors. Yeah. We know that the risk of getting it from animals is low, but it's still important to be careful, especially if you're in one of those higher risk groups and avoiding handling wildlife is always a good idea. Good advice. This has been a lot of information, so let's pause here for a second so everyone can process everything. We've laid the groundwork, but there's more to come. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. You know, it's really interesting how this whole situation has kind of brought the One Health concept to the forefront. Yeah, it's like a light bulb moment for a lot of people. You know, we always think about human health, animal health, and environmental health as separate things. But this is a reminder that they're all connected. We can't just ignore the fact that a virus and birds could end up impacting us. Exactly. And this interconnectedness really highlights the need to be proactive. You know, surveillance, early detection, a coordinated response across all these different sectors. Like, it's a team effort. This feels like a wake-up call. A reminder that we need to be prepared, especially as the lines between human and animal health become more and more blurry. Couldn't agree more. Now let's talk about the economic side of things for a moment. The poultry industry has obviously been hit hard. It's so sad to think about all those birds, but it goes beyond that. There's the financial impact on the farmers and the entire industry. Absolutely. It's a domino effect. Mm -hmm. Loss of livestock, disruptions to the supply chain, even consumer confidence takes a hit. All of this can really ripple through the economy. It's a reminder of how fragile those systems can be and how important it is to support those agricultural communities, especially now. Speaking of support, let's think about those workers on the front lines. Their safety and well-being should be a priority. Totally. They're the ones dealing with the poultry directly, often in close quarters. Their health and livelihoods are paramount. And that's why the United Farm Workers calling for employer education and worker support is so important. It's about giving workers information about the virus, making sure they have the right gear, making sure they have access to testing and health care. And we can't forget about the economic hardship. You know, mm -hmm. nobody should have to choose between their health and their paycheck. Absolutely. This outbreak shows how much we need strong safety nets for everyone, especially those essential workers who are often the most vulnerable. Well said. So as we start to wrap up our deep dive on this outbreak, what are the key takeaways here? What's the so what for our listeners? Good question. It's been a lot of info, so let's try to break it down. Okay, first and foremost, this situation is concerning, but the risk of widespread transmission to humans is still low. Don't panic. Right, but stay informed. Knowing the symptoms, understanding the spread, taking precautions, those things can really make a difference. Absolutely, and let's not forget the big picture here. This is a powerful reminder that human, animal, and environmental health are all intertwined. We need to be thinking about one health if we want to address these kinds of challenges effectively. It's a call to action for all of us. On a personal level, we can play a role by following the advice from experts, avoiding wild birds, reporting any sick wildlife, and don't underestimate hygiene. Now, before we wrap up completely, I want to leave our listeners with a thought, something to think about. I like a good brain teaser. Let's hear it. This outbreak has really shown some vulnerabilities in our public health systems, in our food systems. So it begs the question, how can we learn from this and build more resilient systems that can handle future outbreaks, whether they're from animals, the environment, or somewhere else? We need to be proactive. 
Yeah, that's a powerful question. Makes you think beyond this one event and about the bigger picture. You know, we can't just react each time something like this happens. We need to be more proactive and find ways to make our systems tougher. I agree. It's about thinking ahead, investing in research, fostering collaboration across different fields. Imagine if we could see these outbreaks coming before they even happen, or at least be better prepared to deal with them. That's the goal. It's like we need to shift from from fighting fires to preventing them in the first place. This has really been like a crash course in zoonotic diseases. It really has. You know, the ones that jump from animals to humans. And it highlights the need for a more connected approach to public health. We can't keep treating human, animal, and environmental health as separate things. It's all connected. It is. It's a delicate balance for sure. Messing with one part can impact the other. It's like this bird flu. It's a perfect example. Exactly. And as the world becomes more connected, the potential for these outbreaks to spread quickly increases too. International cooperation and coordinated responses are more important than ever. It's a global problem that needs global solutions. We're all in this together. So as we wrap up today, what's the one message you want our listeners to take away? What's the most important thing for them to remember? I'd say knowledge is power. Stay informed, stay vigilant, and be proactive. We can't control everything, but we can empower ourselves with the right information and tools. Don't be afraid to ask questions, to find reliable sources, and be an active participant in your health and the health of your community. Well said. A huge thank you to you for being here with us today and sharing your insights. It's been an amazing conversation. And to our listeners, thanks for joining us on this deep dive. We'll be back soon with another interesting topic to explore. Until then, stay curious and stay warm.